I'm gonna go right, like just let's just zoom right into it. No, Tip. I want to have a few more awkward silences. Oh, I like those. <laughs> just kidding. Okay, go. I, I, as soon as I said it, I knew you were gonna do that. Fine. Tip number one: the right expectations. Oh, let's explain that. <laughs> what let's what what does the right expectations mean in your mind? Are you praying? No, I'm just listening uh, intently. <laughs> um, the right expectations actually can be sort of, it could go in, in a bunch of different directions. Um, the first one is having the right, right expectations actually also needs to match your dog's experience level and their age. And I yeah. don't want to get too hung up on age because sometimes people get really, really sp specific about age because they think at a certain age the dog should be able to do xyz and so forth and my dogs when my dog's this age what should i be training it and where should i be well it really depends on where you are with your foundation level um and the thing with walking and the right expectations is if you've not really taught your dog how to walk on leash because i'm not sure if you realize this but it is very much a trained skill for 99 percent of dogs out yeah. there there are very few dogs that just you attach a leash and they walk magically down the street without ever pulling we have to train our dogs how to understand to keep the leash loose for us how to walk at our side how to change directions how to leave things when we ask them to um how to you know combat distractions how to not get worried about loud noises there are so many things that happen on a walk and if we haven't taken the time to actually teach our dogs how to do that and we just expect them to be able to go out and walk like a pro um, we're not being realistic about our expectations and essentially we end up setting our dog up for failure so we do need to make sure that our expectations are um, the right ones and they are realistic yeah I think and to add on to that this is a struggle that I had this is a struggle that I know a lot of students have you know we're talking we get to talk to our life skills students uh, frequently in the halls and you get a foundation and maybe you maybe this is where you are you've got like a foundation sometimes your dog is walking great on their on a loose leash in at your side and the moment a distraction comes by or the moment you like how about this one I know a lot of people that will walk out uh, wherever it is let's say to the end of your street or you're headed around the block or whatever and you get to that coming home point and all of a sudden your dog forgets every skill that they've learned you need to understand you need to have the right expectations for your dog so what is what does that mean you know maybe you change how far those walks are maybe you change where you're walking maybe you just need to re reinforce that first quarter and then really work your butt off to make your way back but um having can i um you just reminded me of a story yeah yeah um there was a, a dog that um that i was training um and i had a lot of trouble um, actually walking towards uh, the park area where I would go to like throw something and exercise her. And uh, then once we would exercise her, she would walk back like just perfect. And what started to happen is because I was in a bit of a routine and we would head to the park and she knew fun things happened at the park and we were gonna play and do all kinds of things, it really actually made walking to the park um, a little more challenging. So instead of putting her in that scenario, where she could just learn to drag me, um, I either A, put her in the car and drove the uh, 50 feet to where the park was. Right. I would take her out so we weren't rehearsing pulling. We'd do our thing, we'd play, and then I could walk back at that point and then go back and get my car. Sounds crazy, but it was to work on not um, letting her rehearse the, pro the process. Uh, or the second thing that I would do is I would walk a quarter of the way to the park and then turn around and walk back to my house. And then I would just repeat that pattern so that as she started to get ramped up, as we got closer to the park, I would turn and walk back to the house and she'd be like, hey, where are we going? Right. So it put me more in the driver's seat rather than just monotonously practicing the same thing over and over and over again. Again, I'm changing my expectations to allow her to not rehearse the wrong things and then try to redirect her attention to something that's a little bit more appropriate. Mary H. Our friend Mary. Dropping the super sticker. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much, Mary. That's Always great. Always the cutest little stickers. I know. I know. Love it. We'll have to get our <clears throat> train station lights uh, back up and running. We'll have to talk to Sam Crenshaw. See They're if blue. Get those things fixed because up, that's fixed blue. Up. Are they? Maybe. Yeah. That might be the case. Ken's, they color, the blue? Ken's color blind, if you oh. guys didn't know. It, is, I, want, it I, wanted, is. I wanted to talk about the right expectations for a second because some people would say, well, like, that's ridiculous. Why would you drive 50 feet? 
uh, to take your to do walking training. I'm a smart this dog is, trainer. But this is exactly this is exactly why mm -hmm. we uh, very quickly get the dogs trained. We very quickly help students to train their dogs because we give them these tips. But we also there's accountability there. Like we're saying, you're you can make it easier. The thing that I learned really quickly was that um, you know allowing my dog to rehearse the bad stuff was so much worse than not doing the training. Um, the moment I change, Especially when it's self-rewarding. Right, absolutely. Yeah, and that self-rewarding doesn't mean, you know, you, your dog's pulling towards something. They don't have to get there. It could be the act of pulling towards that thing. It that, could, like, excited, heightened state totally. is really fun for a dog to be in. Totally, yeah. So changing your training plan and, and making yourself uh, accountable for, like, the decisions that you're making when you set out to train your dog. This is before you've even stepped out the door. You're like, okay, you're, what are my expectations? What am I going to struggle with? What am I going to go out of my way to avoid? Listen, we have students from, uh, you know, Manhattan to the mountains of Maine. That was good. I'm glad I connected all those M's. But, um, you know, everyone is able to find some space that will work to get those foundations built as they build up their, build up their expectations for their dog. Um, uh, uh, lots of links. Luton, drop in the super chat. <laughs> this is amazing. We haven't seen lots of links in the super chat in Dan, a long time. Dan, you are so ridiculous. Just because you guys are on the wild side tonight, not now, but before the end of the show, thumb war, loser eats a dog treat. <laughs> <laughs> This is, uh, that takes us back to like season one that or season does. two. We used to have ridiculous uh, uh, competitions and then one of us would have to eat dog it's treats after. School. I never had to eat a dog treat, guys. Yeah, it's true. Um, but, but <laughs> Not so sure about my thumb war skills, but I'm willing to give it a try. <laughs> going out of your way, you know, really um, setting, those ex setting those expectations high, going out of your way so to set your dog up to be successful is, is a great move. Um, which brings us to the next point, because this is something that's so common, and I feel bad for people that are working their butt off. They feel like they're making the right choices, but just not quite working. And they're like, I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah. It's not working right here. And that is collar fit. Yes. This comes down, we talk a lot about equipment. If you're using a harness and you're, you're struggling with leash walking training, Stop using the harness. We want you to be on a neck collar uh, or a head collar. The gentle leader, we can talk a little bit about the gentle leader later. Um, but having the right fitment on your dog, if you're struggling with leash walking, is going to make a huge difference. Why is collar fitment even important? Yeah, it is, it, it's important because um, the type of equipment you use with your dog is going to help you with having good timing. It's going to um, give you better control. Also from the dog's perspective, you know, if they're on a poorly fit collar that's too loose that's nice. or too skinny and the dog can, um, you know, flip around and feel like they can escape, you know, at any time, they sometimes think that there's a possibility there and they aren't as relaxed. They aren't as um, apt to, to be under control. So uh, it's important to have well-fit equipment, good quality equipment that you can use um, correctly. And if you don't know how to use it correctly, that's where we come in right. to help you with that. Um, but another th important thing is that, you know, one thing that we know about dog training is that every dog is a little bit different. And I wanted to say, just saw a comment come up about the YouTube channel. Our YouTube channel is amazing. And you've probably found us because you've watched, you know, so many of our videos, which is awesome. But I'm going to tell you that our YouTube videos give you a sliver of information that you need to use in order to walk your dog on a loose leash. It also, we try to give general information so that most of the people watching is going to work for their dog. Yeah. But what happens with dogs is every dog is a little bit different. So when we get people that come to our classes or sign up for online and we get to know those dogs, I can usually tell with them 60 seconds of meeting a dog what kind of equipment they should be trained on based on their body type based on their um, excitement level based on their training based on the person's ability I'm able to match that person and that dog up with good um, equipment and sometimes it's just a regular collar sometimes it's a gentle leader sometimes it's a specific leash there's lots of things that we can do that will set the person up for success so it's really really important that we have good equipment because sometimes one thing doesn't work on every single dog we need to adapt it um someone uh, we just saw i just saw a comment about equipment so okay. um the the fitment of the collar having it maybe uh, did, did you talk specifically about the dog not allowing uh, uh, like being fit right so that it can't like 
slide down I did to not. the bottom of I was gonna chest. I don't, we don't have a buckle collar lying so. around. Sam? <laughs> Sam, do we have a collar in the closet? I have lots of collars, but back. none of we'll which see. are appropriate to show right um, now. Okay. So uh, what does that mean? It means that there's like beads and oh, there's not. They're like, not like training. They're collars. like fan. They're oh, like okay. show collars, yeah, like yeah. fancy collars. Yeah. They're not like the Very, dog's training. Kill has lots of fancy. Collars. I might have a bit of a problem, guys. Yeah. So yeah, all of the dogs have their own vibe. Let's talk. <laughs> let's talk briefly about equipment. I saw someone say like, uh, does a leash? Does a leash really matter? Yeah. Like, what about a retractable leash? Mm-mm. Actually, let's talk about retractable leashes and why they're horrible for teaching walking. Um, you know, the thing that's, that's difficult about retractable leashes is, you know, when your dog is able to get out to the end of the leash, um, you know, when they're 30 feet away from you, 15 feet away from you, it's very difficult to have good control over them. And you might think to yourself, well, I can just, you know, push the button and it stops it from retracting. But the thing, what we want to do with teaching our walking, so what McCann's, um, what our expectation is for dogs, is that they learn to walk on a loose leash. And we actually talk about like a gentle J. So when the clip is attached to the dog's collar, we actually want that clip pointing towards the ground so that the leash has zero tension on it. We train the dogs to have what's called leash respect. So when the leash is on, we train the dogs never to put tension on the leash so they learn to keep it loose. Whether they're at our side, they can be a little bit in front of us. All of that is okay, but there should be no tension. And where the retractable leash comes in is the retractable leash always has tension. Mm -hmm. And this can be a little bit confusing, especially for dogs in training, that sometimes they wear a leash that's always tight, and then sometimes they're told, no, no, you're never allowed to have a tight leash. And that can be a little bit confusing. Now, I have, I use a retractable leash um, sometimes with my uh, trained dogs. I have a 16-year-old dog that is completely deaf at this point. Yeah. We walk her on a, on a, a flexi line, a retractable leash, um, because it gives her a little bit more freedom and it allows me to keep her safe because she can't hear me. But I would never train a dog on one because it doesn't give me good control or timing and it does send the dog uh, mixed messages. Yeah, and I mean, it's just not... Not a very versatile. It can be dangerous too. It's a, not a very versatile leash. We um. So the next, the we next like point. We like six foot leashes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and we prefer um, leather in material um, because they uh, are nicer to hold. They have a little bit of give to them. Yeah. They last for years and years and years and years. I, I have had leashes that are thirty years old. They're unbelievable. I still have these for a leash. Yeah. Yeah. So that's I mean, not thirty years old. That makes Seven. me sound very old. That's not. That's a bit of an exaggeration. I would say like twenty five. I have. <laughs> It doesn't help that much. Um, I mean, Dee's leash has got to be 20. 17 years old now. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, and it's still great. And it was a McCann Dog's leash. It was the first leash I think I bought, like, intentionally. It lasts for forever. Yeah. Um, Kale talked a little bit about tension. Um, oh, the other thing that you can't do. So we talk a lot about uh, working towards a situation where your dog is walking in at your side because you've given them great information, not because they're on leash. What ultimately, what we're training towards is the idea that your the leash is there, but your dog doesn't even r realize it because they're making great choices yeah. in at your in at your side. They're walking on a loose leash, and during that training period. As you need to redirect them or, you know, turn them away from stuff or whatever, keep them from, you know, becoming a, a you know, uh, running out in the street or doing something cr crazy on you, you need to be able to slide that hand on the leash and give them, you know, turn them, be able to turn them. It's better to be able to give them specific information with your hand sliding down the leash, which you can't do on a retractable leash, and then down by the clip of their collar, being able to like guide them back or bring them back to your side or whatever the situation is, um, it's valuable to be able to give them that specific information rather than being at the end of a thing where there's like six or seven or 12 feet out. Now you can't really give them specific information. The same thing applies to a harness. The nice part about having that head control with the collar being up high, nice flat buckle collar. Actually, I think we have a package that's available tonight um that is we'll put a discount on dogs that pull yeah dogs that pull package bundle i think uh yeah dan lots of links to just put it in so flat buckle collar it's just a simple nylon collar that's got you know single hole it's adjustable that's the best place to start with your leash walking training because it gives it all great information and it's so easy. It's a versatile collar, easy to clean, but it's so easy to uh, you know work your way off of having to have a leash on the dog all the time. Talking about tension, which is uh, number three. Um, it's so important. This is the thing that I didn't really understand. You know, we talk a little bit about, um, I mean, there's so many breeds. If you have a, a sled dog, a snow dog, uh, you know, a Husky, Malamute, something like that. I mean, those dogs are trained to pull. Mm -hmm. And um, 
they need to learn, and we've had lots of them in classes oh, that yeah. learn this. Okay. People say like, oh, you know, it's a sled dog. They just love to pull. They don't, they might, but you can very quickly teach them to not pull. Mm-hmm. You know, don't use the breed as an excuse. If your dog, if there's tension on your leash, you're doing something wrong. So as you're working in your training, if you're about to reward and you realize all of a sudden like, oh boy, I, there's, there's this leash is tight. That's not the time to reward. Get your dog back in position. If you accidentally add to this happens all the time, you know, don't feel silly if this happens, but people will turn into the Statue of Liberty and we see it all the time, but they're walking along, their dog's doing a great job. They'll go down to reward their dog and then they bring their hand up and it adds tension to the leash. Now we're rewarding our dogs on a tight leash, exactly the opposite mm-hmm. thing we want to be doing. So if you're going through your walking training and you identify the fact that my leash is tight, something isn't right with the, the situation, don't reward them at that point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Really important. Now I saw a comment that I want to speak to that I liked because this is it's that time of year. And Diane said, Blowing leaves and squirrels. That's probably the biggest challenge. It's very exciting. So the next point that I want to talk about is being proactive. Proactive versus reactive Mm -hmm. in your leash walking training. So it can be, we, we see students who, as you're learning your leash walking, we see students who struggle a little bit and we have to coach them through this, but they're like paying attention to all, there's lots going on, you know, leash gathered up the right length, you know, you have your dog in at your side, you're uh, insisting that they remain in at your side, and then you start moving forward Mm -hmm. and there's things happening around you. Well, what if you could work on these activities in your hallway to sort of get the hang of things? You're proactively like figuring out how, how you hold your leash, how you reward your dog. And then you decide, okay, it, that's going well. Let's go out into the driveway. Are you being proactive enough to think time of day? What kind of distractions am I going to run into? Mm-hmm. What sort of struggles am I going to have? And how can I make it less of a struggle? It's really important to set that game plan up ahead of time because the last thing you want to be doing is going out for a walk and then, oh, leaf, oh, squirrel, oh, thing, oh, here goes a car, oh, yeah, there's another dog. All of these situations make it really challenging for you to be successful. It's also too much for your dog at this level of their training if you're struggling with leash walking. So I really want you to think about being proactive. The other thing that I see or I hear often, maybe you're at this, let me know if you're at this point. You go for a walk, things are going pretty well. Then someone is across the street or someone is down the street or there's a dog at a house that you're walking by and you lose control. You know, you you just completely lose control of your dog. Let me know if that's you in the chat. Can I um, just give it like a realistic um, example? Oh, I'd love for you to. (laughs) Well, I was going to give it, even if you said no, but uh, (laughs) um, we'll use the the leaf, the leaf blowing thing um, with reactive versus a proactive versus reactive. So if I was being reactive, that would be kind of what Ken was saying. I'm out for a a walk with my dog. I'm not really expecting, you know, the neighbor to all of a sudden, you know, blow leaves or that thing machine to turn on or whatever the situation is. And now all of a sudden I'm having to like deal with a dog that's already at a heightened state, which is very, very difficult. Um, to bring them back down to reality. So, um, you know, and you can and you should and you have to work hard on that. But if I feel like this is a potential uh, problem that could happen with leaves or with other things, what I want to do is be proactive and try to give my dogs um, a taste of these experiences in a setting in which I can control. So if I know this could be a potential issue or maybe I experience it and I think, well, that didn't really go well. How am I going to How am I going to prevent this from happening in the future? Well, I can go home and I can say, Ken, can we spend 10 minutes outside? You get the leaf blower out. I'm going to get the puppy out. going to get my leash, going to get my bait bag. I'm going to get my thing out. He blows leaves like on the other side of the lawn. And I practice some sits at my side or some, you know, a few moments of walking or some stays, response to name, tugging out, whatever it is. And then he could come a little closer. That's being proactive. That's showing my dog, hey, see what's happening over there? Don't worry about that. We're doing stuff together here. And now I can control how far I am from that distraction, how long I want the distraction to happen. Because at any time I feel like my dog is like losing their brain. I can yell to Ken and say, cut it (laughs) so that I can work through it. So then 
if I do that a couple times, I'm going to see progress. And then when I head back out into the real world again and I get that leaf blower, I have a dog that says, ooh, last time this situation happened, I turned and looked at you and you rewarded me or you played tug or we had a lot of fun together and I'm reconditioning him how to react and how to behave in those situations. The problem is, is that people want to give their dog this magic pill or this magic tool or this quick answer to fix these things. And what's very difficult about many dog behaviors, but specifically walking on leash is that there isn't a quick fix, especially if you've now spent weeks or months rehearsing poor walking. Unfortunately, you have a little bit of work to do and we're going to be truthful with you about that because we know how dog training works and it does take a bit of work. And if you can set aside some time to um, train your dog rather than test your dog, circling all the way back to the expectation thing, you will see a difference. But again, these are things that we do in our programs because sometimes people don't know how to break it down because you know it's sort of thinking from a dog training perspective rather than your normal Every day, you got a dog. You want to take it for a walk. Right. That's what happens. Yeah, that's the worst but mistake. But to yeah. us, that's our that's the goal. Yeah. Our we got a dog yeah. with the eventual goal of taking our dogs for a walk, um, going for hikes. You know, our dogs do all kinds of things like that, but they don't as puppies no. until they're trained. Yeah, actually, let us know in the chat. What do you do for exercise for your dog? Um, let, just let me know. I don't want to guide the conversation, but. It's really important to understand that if you're struggling with leash walking and you feel like it's not going well, stop taking your dog for a walk. Stop letting them pull you down the street. You need to be training your dog how to walk on leash. That doesn't mean you're just not going to go anymore. It means that you're going to work in tiny little sections, insisting on great results, working down the driveway, working 30 feet and then coming back. But you're going to need something to replace. the Dogs need exercise. They need exercise. And in fact, you know, the more they're exercised, the less trouble they're going to get into, the easier your next walking training session is going to be. Um, You know, it just takes that edge off a little bit. The fitter they are, the longer they live. Right. It's so true. (laughs) Yeah, there's an interesting side about trained dogs living longer than uh, untrained dogs. I can believe that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it makes me wonder if it's a correlation or causation thing. You know, how much of that is a more more intentional dog owner that's, Mm -hmm. you know, careful about the decisions they make with their dog. Knows their dog dog better. Knows their dog better. You can identify problems earlier. I think there's I'm too good at that. Yeah. (laughs) So, um, Ashley says tug for sure. Yeah, we love tug for sh- tug absolutely. and fetch. Yeah, um, I love playing fetch. I see tug, with tug, my dogs. fetch, and hiding kibble all over the house for my corgi to go sniff out. Oh, that's good. Yeah, tug and fetch, hide, hide and seek. Where Mills also likes hide and seek. Yeah, nice. we actually did a video sh- talking about how you could do hide and seek, and I, I think it was with instructor Carol, and it might have been like a response to name game that uh, she'd come up with, but that was a fun video. Yeah, maybe you could find that. I mean, I don't know if it's. We have a couple of things. We also have that one that I did. um, It was during COVID. Yeah. um, uh, Games that you can play with your dogs in the living room. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, That's right. And uh, just we were all stuck inside. How do you keep these dogs busy? Totally. I mean, Mm -hmm. honestly, this is exactly the kind of stuff you need to be doing to supplement your walking training. So Until rather than yeah. going out and getting dragged around the uh, uh, block, you're going to do these short walking training sessions, and then you're going to do some some of the uh, you know playing tug, playing fetch if your mm-hmm. dog has a great fetch, um, doing some of the mental exercises. Exercising your dog's brain is a great way to uh, exercise them more wholly. You know, having them uh, feel more tired at the end of the night. Um, if you do just trick training, like it's so simple, it doesn't sound like it's super. Uh, so it's not great exercise, and it isn't great physical exercise, but it's great mental exercise. So mm-hmm. adding that to your training plan, it'll make a world of difference. You will be surprised how valuable that will be for mm-hmm. you and your dog. Um, so talking about, what did we just talk about? Being proactive versus reactive. Understanding, so, so let's talk about, I saw a few of you guys that were struggling with there's something coming down the street or your dog sees the neighbor or something happens, uh, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna be proactive about that? One of the strategies is turning. I mean, we have we have a thousand videos on YouTube, more than that now. Uh, we talk about turning in, in, in a lot of them. What does turning mean when it comes to leash walking training and how can, be, how can it be used proactively to help people to have better walking training? 
So we use change of direction. Specifically, we like doing like an about turn with the dog so that the dog is able to maintain um, position at our side. But we do it for a number of reasons. Number one, it puts us back in the driver's seat because we are now choosing the next direction. And then more importantly, it helps to move the dog further away from the distraction. Sometimes um, the go-to thing for people is when the dog is distracted and they're wanting to go and pull towards something, people like to uh, put tension on the dog's leash to pull them away from whatever they're distracted and they often just want to do like a wide berth around the distraction and then keep going with where they're going but during that process your dog is continuing to pull on the leash as you're doing that and then get totally disconnected from you both things that we're trying to avoid in that moment so we actually find it's a lot more effective to um you know keep your eyes on the road ahead to make sure you can predict things that are coming and then if your dog starts to speed up or they start to get a bit distracted they want to go to pull you're going to do a 180 degree turn and literally walk in the other direction and get farther and farther and farther away from the distraction. And at some point, your dog's gonna be far enough away and you're gonna be engaging and using your body language and um, you know uh, adjusting the leash and, and all of those things appropriately that your dog's gonna go, oh, wait, you want are, do you want my attention? Totally. And then that's your little window to say yes, and then you can reward your dog at that point. Um, but the changing of direction makes such a big process, uh, um, such a big improvement. In fact, I'll do that even when there's no distractions around. I will do like a, sort of look like a bit of like ping pong ball, but. I will go back and forth or sometimes too if my dog is a little bit further along in their walking training but I'm getting things like the dog forging ahead or sometimes like cutting across from me I'll actually do turns but I'll turn to my left so the dog yeah. um, has to actually back up out of my way and I'll yeah. walk in a big circle to my left so the dog is on the inside of the turn and so they have to kind of learn to back up and stay out of my way and each time they sort of um, yield to me then I can yes and reward them and they go, oh, this sweet spot is at, at your left-hand side. You really like it when I'm there. So um, that can be accomplished way, way, way faster and more clearly with turning rather than going straight. Yeah, and you know, to speak back, um, someone had said like, well, what kind of collar is it? A flat buckle collar, super standard dog collar. There's nothing that interesting about it. It is the most simple of collars. It's not dynamic, yeah. it doesn't tighten. It just stays at a certain um, you know, size. Um, but this is why a head collar or a neck collar is a way better training tool is in situations like this when you do need to be proactive and guide your dog away from disaster the pivot point is their head so now they're where your head goes your body follows dogs are exactly the same way so as you guide their head in a different direction maybe it's a turn to the right maybe it's a turn to the left whatever um, their body naturally follows you're not struggling with you're not pulling out treats all the time you're not struggling with well geez I can't quite get you know it's, it's the pivot points the center of their body they're spinning around in a circle it doesn't have to be that difficult you can give them clearer better information if you just guide them away from that distraction and mm -hmm. once they get back in position pour on the treats like you can absolutely reward them like crazy when you get when you're getting that nice loose leash walking back at your side the other thing that we should talk about is your voice now this was a real struggle for me uh, uh, I noticed over the years of being a dog trainer this is generally guys struggle with this more than uh, you ladies um, they're guys are just a little bit like more I don't know they're more reserved Maybe in, when they're just, training just a dog. It's just not as fun. Yeah, well, they, they aren't. You guys were just not as fun when we're training a dog. And I'll tell you, you watch a room full of uh, dog trainers. We have a, a, you know, there's a handful of incredible dog trainers uh, at McCann Dogs that are male. And they're the loudest ones in the room. Like they can be bubbly and outgoing because they know how impactful that is for mm -hmm. the dog. Now, that doesn't mean you need to be squeaky. And we just, it's about whatever connects to your dog. It's pretty good. Okay. You've probably seen videos where Kale is teaching a puppy. I, don't, I mean, it depends on when you found the channel, but where Kale's training a puppy and she, people always comment on her voice. The, she uses that voice two reasons. Number one, she's genuinely like that. Like when we're recording a video, she is genuinely <laughs> that excited when, uh, you know, the puppy does something great or when she captures a great moment or whatever. But it's also effective. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about using your voice in a leash walking scenario and how people might think you're yeah. crazy, but yeah. here's why it's valuable. I was just laughing to myself because I was just editing some um, training videos for my um, agility programs and uh, I was training my my 
puppy. I call him a puppy, but he's almost two years old. And um, the video was about 15 minutes long, and I pared it down to about seven minutes. And everything that I erased was literally just me, like, playing and cheering and playing right. and cheering. I thought, oh, my gosh, how long does somebody want to watch this? So I had to edit it all out because it was getting – I was even getting annoyed by it. But um, – my dog loves it. Yeah. Um, anyways, I forget what you asked me. Uh, just talking about the value of using your voice in leash walking. What, like, why? Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, yeah, so using your voice in leash walking um, can do uh, a couple things. You could use it proactively to get your dog's attention back on you if you think that they're going to be distracted. We um, teach the dogs to respond to the, uh, a command, leave it. So if I see or feel my dog disconnecting and going towards a distraction, I could say leave it and then, re you know, do my little um, about turn go the other direction um, but I also can use it to mold and shape my dog's behavior to be what I like so right. I need to make sure that when I'm praising my dog or when I'm marking when my dog is correct so we use the word yes when our dog is correct and then we um, in addition to the word yes use praise so um, you know if I look down and my dog had a loose leash check my dog had good position on my left hand side check my dog was um engaging with me you know checking in from time to time that would cause me to say yes and then get out a reward uh, for my dog during the training um and i would do that there's no cap as to how many times i would do that i would continue doing it as long as i was getting what i wanted um but sometimes what happens is um, the dog isn't doing, you know, all three things perfectly. Or maybe you give the dog a treat and they think, oh, I'm so great. And then they, you know, disengage. You know, I might give my dog a treat and then uh, even though I have no food in my hands, I can actually still keep engagement from my dog by continuing to use my voice but if i'm completely quiet and i'm not really exuding a lot of energy dogs will be dogs and they're going to be attracted to you know movement and noise and things that are happening around you so if you um can keep yourself a little bit more animated a lot of dogs are like what is going on up there this is really exciting and i can keep my dog's focus i will say this though is sometimes people do make such a wonderful effort of using their voice and engaging. But if you actually look to see what's happening, sometimes people, although they sound wonderful, they actually are doing the voice with very poor timing. Mm, and, yeah, you know, the right. dog's leash will be tight or the dog's sniffing and you see the person going, good dog, good dog. Not good dog in that moment. So yeah. you also want to make sure that when you're using your voice, that you're using it in good timing. So again, you're molding and shaping your dog to uh, to do the right thing. So um, voice is so important. How and when you use it. Yeah, I mean, and when you use it, there might come a time where you, your leash needs to do the talking. Yep. You know, you're going to stop praising. You're going to turn the other direction. Um, it is important that you're not uh, using your... Don't, don't think that your voice is going to solve every problem. Um, it's nice to get your dog's attention. It's a great way to bridge the time between rewards. Maybe you're at the point right now where you're like, geez, I'd love to use less treats on walks. That's where your voice comes in. Your voice is a powerful tool to bridge those bridge those rewards. And then, you know, your dog gets out of position or whatever, you're going to stop praising, get them back in position, and continue walking. Once they're there, mm -hmm. you can pour those, uh, use that praise again. Really use your voice. Yeah. Um, we have to, if we're, if we're talking about voice, we have to talk about speed. Mm -hmm. We have to talk about the speed because I know that it probably seems like a lot right now. And as the more you practice your leash walking, the better you're going to get at it, obviously. But when you're, you might be at a point right now where you're thinking about all the things. You're like, what did I hear in the train station last night? Like, okay, I need to think about my voice. I need to remember turning what's my proactive training plan and as you start going and you're thinking about all these things you're walking really slowly and this is exactly why so many dogs struggle in the initial stages now this is something we'll actually do as we proof through some of the skills with our life skills students but like as we build out the uh dog skill set um or, or you know early in in their uh, early in their training we want to keep the speed up now it's not like <clears throat> running but we want to walk at a purposeful pace why is a purposeful pace so a important purposeful? at the very beginning of the leash walking training um it's so important because it helps to keep the dog's attention you know you we always tell yeah. our students you know try and walk like you're late for something or i always joke like walk like you have to go to the bathroom really bad like really like right. walk with pace and that a lot of dogs are like holy cow where are you going and then they want to kind of keep the pace when people walk slowly um it's really you know it's really easy for the dog to disengage and to start looking around now 
the tips that we're giving you um, are not what your walking needs to look like forever. You don't right. need to be hunched over, you yeah. know, with treats in your dog's nose. You're not going to be, you know, using this crazy voice the entire time. You're not yeah. going to be speed walking the entire time. Eventually, we're working towards being able to walk like a normal person down the street and our dog just knows how to hang out with us. But there's additional things that we do in the teaching uh, phase of training, which is what we're highlighting tonight, where we do things a little bit extra to kind of make our dogs have an easier time doing exactly what we want them to do. Totally. Um, and I think it's important to say that we do wean off of this stuff eventually. Um, but sometimes people don't think about adding more voice or changing up the speed of their walking or even changing direction. Um, but again, these are teaching tactics that we do because we know it re-engages the dog. And when you have a dog that's focused, you have a dog that's earning more rewards. You have a dog that's happier to do the job. You have a person that is enjoying, enjoying walking the dog at that point, and it all becomes, you know, a wonderful moment. Well, and how many people have a dog that's constantly sniffing the ground or, you know, searching the floor for treats and that kind of thing? Yeah. You know, this is exactly what that dog needs. They need to move more quickly. They need to, uh, you know, understand that, listen, buddy, we're going somewhere, and you're going to naturally notice that dog checks in with you. Here's the other thing. You become way more fun. We talked a little bit earlier yeah. about you need to be interesting to your dogs. If you're not, if your dog is completely blowing you off, it's because you're not that interesting. You haven't done enough to get their attention. You haven't done enough to build value on you. So increasing your speed is a simple way to do that. Uh, it's really great. It's a really important first step when we're talking about trying to make it a little bit easier for your pup. Now, I have a video that I cut out because I wanted to talk about this. We need to talk a little bit about location and, and kind of time of day, but I wanted to talk about, you might you might feel like you're struggling um, as soon as you go out the door. You might feel like, geez, my walking goes well uh, once I get to, until I get to the park and then everything falls apart. You need to understand, going back to number one, expectations. What's the expectation you have for your dog? If you expect them to make mistakes at a certain point, I have an exercise that I want to introduce to you that instructor Carol did. This is an old video, but I thought I thought it was really appropriate for tonight's audience. So let's take a look at that. Okay, good for audio. Great. See, Lucy's pretty excited about getting over there. We're about to go through the gate and she's anticipating that. You ever have that? You're leaving your house, your dog can't wait to go, they're pulling your arm off. Or they're fighting you to get out of that car to get to the park. Well, we're gonna change the, the game a little bit. In order to get where she wants to go, she's gonna have to focus on me. So, so for those of you who the moment you go out the door, your dog bursts through, what if you spend a little bit of time in the doorway? What if you spend a couple of minutes on your landing getting some attention so that you you know that your dog, is, you know, it wants to be outside, wants to go outside. Well, what if the only way they could get that was through you? So keep that in mind. If you're struggling, the moment you step out the door, this exercise, Carol's going to show it on a, like a park fen uh, fence, like a park gate. Um, but this could apply to the, the front door of your house too, if that's where your dog starts to f uh, mm -hmm. fail. My value's going way up because I provide that great area. Let's see how I work it. Ready? Oh, we're pulling. Oh, I exist. I do, yeah. Oh, good girl, Eve. That's what Now, this might take some patience. Uh, and that's exactly what instructor Carol is insisting on here. She's not going, it's not about, when you go for a walk, it's not about getting to a place, it's about training. Mm -hmm. And this is what Carol knows. If she doesn't get through the, the, the gate today, so be it. it. This is about training. This moment is about teaching Lucy to pay attention to her before she goes through that gate. Better, so when she's on a loose leash, I'll, re I'll praise her, yay. Good girl. And I don't need to reward with yes. food because she's getting what she wants by going through there. That's the best reward ever. Carol was talking yes. about Yes. Good there. girl. Good girl. Oh, a little bit of tension. Black and white. Now, we talked a little bit earlier about tension and Carol said, listen, we're not going anywhere. There can be no tension on this leash. What if you were you, you applied those same principles to your dog training? How clear would it be for your dog? This is, we, we muddy the water so quickly, stuff like this. Uh, when there's tension on the leash, mm -hmm. you know, uh, if we're black and white about these things, your dog's going to learn it faster. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
good girl. Yeah. Very, okay, stop yeah. for a sec. I don't know if you guys, that happened very quickly, but that time, Lucy went to the end of the leash just now. The second she felt tension, without Carol doing anything, she snapped back to make the leash loose. So she's starting to understand that you're not to go forward unless the leash is loose. The leash is loose, so Lucy actually adjusted um, independently that time, which was pretty cool. Oh, did you stammer a little bit? Right? Shut up. Nice. <laughs> yes. Oh, the girl. Oh, I got gotcha. you. And You're I mean, we are, there. we are, there's no room for um, gray. You know, uh, Lucy was ever so gently pulling on that leash, but Carol said, listen, there'll be no leash pulling. Uh, but what I love about what's happening is when she's backing up, she's doing so until Lucy reengages. Totally. She's not just letting, she's not just dragging the dog back and not giving the dog any information. That's an she's backing point. up. And then when the dog see looking right back up her, then she starts to add the praise again. So, you know, when we're training our dogs to do something, we need to let them know when they're wrong by, you know, in this case, we're stopping, stopping the forward motion, not allowing the dog to proceed forward. But then we always need to follow that up with telling the dog when they're right. So, now that we have the engagement, we go back to using that well-timed praise. Totally. Yes. Ready? So Carol's yeah, going to help yeah. her a bit more now that's with it. her voice to help her. Oh, oh that's it. Oh. So she got to lie down, and then we, I think just we must when, have cut the just scene. Just when it was getting exciting. Yeah, so no, what you kidding. what you saw at the end <laughs> was Lucy just was like, okay, I get it. You know, I'm not going to charge th through that gate, and that's, I, I didn't you can't help but being footage. a dog trainer. I could just continue watching that. <laughs> yeah, honestly. <laughs> it's but, interesting. I mean, here's the reality of it. If you're that clear with your dog, you know, it, it makes more sense. It also makes more sense for you. You start to draw a line in the sand. This is what my expectations are. This is what I'll allow. This is what I won't allow. You know, this is, you, you know, my, I, I, you've, and I know uh, you guys in life skills uh, online or in, in class, you talk about like writing a journal, like mm -hmm. have a, know yep. what, what a dog struggles with. Um, but knowing these things and being that intentional about your dog training is exactly where you need to be putting that mental energy. This is what I didn't do when, before I was, you know, when I was a student, like I just didn't understand the value. And then you start to see other students and start to, I became a dog trainer and started to help <laughs> other students. And I thought, man, the people that commit the time and energy to being black and white and very specific about their expectations, they're miles past everybody else, mm -hmm. you know, and that might be the thing that solves uh, the struggles for I'm you. I'm giggling because the online team is making fun of me saying, Loose leash Lucy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a tongue twister. So a location, time of day. The other thing you need to be considering when you're out for a walk um, is, we spoke about this at the beginning, taking your dog for leash walking training at three or four or in the afternoon when all the kids are coming home from school, it's a bad idea. Yeah. Uh, after dinner at 6 p.m. Uh, when the park's busy, Bad idea if for that dog in training. You might you're gonna get there, but that might be overwhelming for your dog. If you're still struggling with leash walking, you need to be really intentional about the time of day you choose, the location you choose mm -hmm. to train your walking. If you're telling yourself like, wow, that sounds like a lot of work, it is. It mm -hmm. is a lot of work, but it's so worth it. And um, it's gonna make a difference. It'll make a difference in your training. Mm -hmm. Um, let's talk a little bit about head control. Now, if you've gotten this far and you're thinking like, boy, uh, my dog's too strong. My dog pulls too much. I don't think I can ever do that turn with them. I can barely control them when they get out and they want to, you know, get down the street to that other dog. We talk about a tool very specifically, a tool called a gentle leader. It's not a halty but it's a head collar. We choose this tool specifically for a few reasons. Can you talk a little bit about what the gentle leader does? It's sort of its value set and yeah. why we choose it? So the gentle leader um, is a head collar. There's a, a loop that goes around their nose, um, sits quite far back so the dog still can open their mouth and do everything. And then it has one loop that goes up behind the ears and it sits very high up on the dog's head right uh, right below their ear line um, for a specific reason. And it deals um, with the premise of uh, pressure rather than pain. Um, so it doesn't hurt the dog at all, hence gentle leader. So you can gently yeah. lead them around. Um, but it does deal with pressure. And why this um, works so well with dogs is that when they pull or when you need to redirect them, they get a little tension, a little pressure 
um, in that area right up behind their ears um, in their sort of scruff area. And this is sort of the same location that their mom would have grabbed and disciplined them uh, with when they were a puppy. Now, um, the gentle leader is certainly way more passive than like a mother dog grabbing a puppy and disciplining them. But um, the premise is, is sort of similar. The dog understands it. But the other cool thing about it is when the dog pulls forward, we have an opportunity to control their head so we can turn them away from distractions much more easily. Or if they're really sniffing and trying to get into things, we can lift their head and turn them much more easily. Easily. When the leash is attached to a, a harness or even for some dogs attached to a collar, which is a very strong part of their um, neck, um, sometimes it can be really difficult if that dog is really leaning in with all of their force. Mm-hmm. Um, why we like the gentle leader specifically over top of other head halters, though, head, head uh, collars, is because it does have the option the, that you could wean off of it. So it sort of has two modes. It has the full mode where the nose loop is over the nose and the back uh, piece is behind their ears. Um, and as, as time goes on and things go well, you're able to slip the nose loop off of the dog and then attach the leash to a little clip underneath their chin. So you just have the remaining strap around their neck. Um, which still sits up nice and high in that, um, you know, more sensitive part of their neck. And again, why we want to do this is our goal is to use, to get great control, but to do it without needing a lot of force and a lot of negativity. Um, We want to try and be gentle, but firm (laughs) with the dogs because we want to get, um, you know, the dogs uh, to listen, but we don't want to have to be yanking and and being frustrated um, on, on the leash. And, um, you know, I really love using gentle leaders and I find sometimes we have people that are a little bit apprehensive to use them because they feel like, you know, they're failing with their dog training and they feel like it's such like a step back. But, um, you know, I, Kale McCann, <laughs> I'm a great dog trainer. 21 time yeah. world champion yeah, but of dog agility. I, I use, I've used a gentle leader with many of my dogs. In fact, Beeline, who is literally a world champion in agility, I walk her into an agility ring on a gentle leader. <laughs> I, I want to talk for a second about um, how so sometimes peaceful. sometimes the benefit of a gentle leader, not only with is it with leash walking training, but for some of those dogs who are like a little bit sensitive in some environments, yeah. it sort of gives them a sense of calm because they realize that you're the one in control. Yeah, yeah, that is good. You know, when I use it around, you know, dog sports with her, I use it because she's very high-minded and I want to keep her calm. But why we initially introduced it is B was quite sensitive and a little nervous around new situations. And when we would take her, um, you know, to expose her to, you know, downtown or take her to places with lots of people or loud noises she was a little bit overwhelmed by that and while we were going through our leash walking training I didn't want to have her in those situations where I needed to pull on the leash or change directions or do anything that was really extravagant um, because she was already feeling a bit uncomfortable and so I found that when I used the gentle leader in those situations I could move her more gently and more passively and it allowed her to get good information but in a little bit of of a less intense way and yeah. it really helped uh, build her confidence. It- um, I do want to say that I think I saw yeah. somewhere way back in the chat that um, they use a gentle leader and it just doesn't work. And I want to speak to that because you know, just like everything, you know, every piece of equipment doesn't work for every dog. But I will tell you that most of the time when I hear that comment from people, it's because they think that when you put a gentle leader on that the gentle leader is going to train the dog for you. But when you have a gentle leader on the dog, you still have to good timing, still have to have good timing, you still have to use the leash properly, you still have to understand leash pressure, you still have to understand timing of your praise. Um, you know, it's not the equipment that's doing the work, the, the equipment is simply helping elevate our dog training skills but we still have to do the work and typically when it's not working when i watch that person interact with the dog the gentle leader is not the problem it's their timings off or they're not holding the leash properly or they're you know making the situation too hard for the dog so um you know regardless of what handling or what uh, equipment that you use it is a big picture that that you need to think about and um gentle leaders don't need to be used for every dog so we're simply uh, giving you that as a training tool because we know know that lots of people get really good success using one Um, and again it's a little it's a little bit more passive rather than using some of the harsher methods out there which is something that aligns with us well and also the goal is to work away from it like there's not many tools out there that 
they're there to help you never use it again. Yeah. You know, that's what I think we love about it. And we should probably talk to Gen Leader about a sponsorship. We're not sponsored by them, but we've been. I've, we should be. I've <laughs> seen them. I've seen that product trans, transfer Deegan's walking. Like mm. that. It just We do, me... however. The Gen Leader Company does make Gen Leaders special for yeah, us, though. Yeah, yeah. Well, because we ask them to. Yeah. yeah. So for um, any of the larger size, medium and um, large Gen Leaders, je the company actually makes them special for us with a metal buckle rather than a snap yeah, so can't because break. it can't break apart. Also, we're Canadian and uh, yeah. it gets cold here. It does. Um, but anyway, the, having the right tools, I mean, they are tools. All of these things are dog training tools. All of the. Um, some of the, the points we've talked about tonight are just tools for you. I mean, using your voice the right way is a tool. Using speed in your training, it's just a tool. You can choose to apply it or not apply. You can also use it wrong. We need to talk ultimately when it, com when it comes to leash walking training, as you saw with Instructor Carol, we reinforced with you guys that she was very black and white about her training. I will tell you the biggest mistake that people make when it comes to leash walking training is they're in consistent and this creates a oh, world yes. of challenges for your dog and you're probably doing it and you're like well what on earth am i going to do like how am i going to fix these situations like we need to talk about consistency and like what what how focusing on consistency uh can be actually like applied so it's maybe it's like a conversation you have with a life skills student yeah, I mean, when you say that, the most common thing that I see is like early in the programs, I see people like get out of their car in the parking lot at the training school right. and their dog drags them across the parking lot, drags them through the lobbies and then get into uh, the hall. And then all of a sudden the dog walks down a loose leash to their chair. Right. And they think like, why is this happening? So true. Well, because when you come to class and the dog pulls, we address it consistently. We train the dog what to do in this type of scenario, but dogs are not robots. They're very situational learners, and if we are not consistent and we allow them to drag us in some situations, it's like that park, the park story I told earlier. If I allow my dog to drag me to the park, and then when I get there, I let her off leash and play ball, and then you know I let her walk perfectly on a loose leash on the way back, and that's what we do over and over again, and I'm not changing behavior, I'm going to get what I'm getting. That's just what happens. So consistency is really important. Also, dogs really, really appreciate when information and rules and everything is black and white. When we're sometimes trainers and when we're sometimes asking and expecting this and other times asking and expecting this, that can create a lot of confusion for dogs. And sometimes what will happen when dogs are confused is they'll either check out or they'll um, retract a little bit. They'll get a little bit unsure and they'll right. show some stress behaviors where they get quite disconnected from their person and they kind of want to avoid. And it's not, it's simply because they're confused by what you're asking them because you're so inconsistent or we have dogs that say clearly with your inconsistency you don't really know what you're doing so I'm gonna lead now and then they just try to run the show because they figure you're inconsistent you're not really giving good information so they need to step up and and make all of the decisions so consistency helps with training it also helps with relationship consistency needs to be you individually with your dog but it also needs to be among family members 100%. what I'm doing with the puppy needs to be the same thing that Ken's doing with the yeah. puppy so that it's easier for the pup to go ah this makes total total sense it's the same thing every time cool i got it um and they'll love they'll love you for that it, it makes them feel a lot more comfortable when the information is delivered in that way when we talk about these points whether it's fitment or you know tension in your leash or what does a proactive training plan even look like maybe it's something maybe you're struggling with i see this often um my dog won't even take treats when we're out on a walk. When it's things like that, this is exactly where the guidance of a professional dog trainer can help you in something like our in-person life skills program or our online life skills program where you're actually supported by professional dog trainers. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to touch on briefly what the uh, online or in-person yeah, life Yeah, and I, like. I think I said this a little bit earlier. I know not, not all of you may have seen the entire, the entire session today, but you know, the thing with actually taking a program, you know, with us specifically is that once we get to know you and your dog, we are able to make 
big adjustments or even sometimes totally. small yep. adjustments yep. to what you're doing with your dog to unlock whatever potential your dog has. Because sometimes when we have, um, you know, we have YouTube videos, we have all of these things, it gives you sort of big picture, but sometimes it's like, I'm do I, I feel like I'm doing that. You think you're doing it That's and right. then you do it in front of our eyes and we're able to tell you six things that yeah. are a little, you know, that you could do a little differently and all of a sudden it's like, now you're on the right track. Um, so with our in-person program and with our online program, program you have access to such amazing instructors it's not just ken and i our team of people is so incredible um I see some of them in here in the yeah um and it just allows you to kind of go through the program training dogs and puppies can be very frustrating sometimes and you know if you can just have a bit of direction and support then sometimes it just makes it a little bit easier um we try to help you to understand a little bit more about how dogs think because it makes you a better dog trainer and we always joke mccann dog trainers we don't take your dog from you and train your dog our job is much harder than that we train you how to train your dog so that when you're at home in everyday life and you're something comes up right totally. or wrong yeah. you know how to say ah I know exactly what to do with this issue and then you're away to the races yeah, absolutely and if you want to figure out about the programs just check out the links in the um, in the chat and we'd love to have you we have also we have so much fun <laughs> we do we yeah. do absolutely now that you're considering the right expectations for your dog, you know about the fitment of their equipment. When you're thinking about the tension, you are planning. Don't forget about talking about the bundle again. For a proactive training plan. Um, when you're talking about turning, using turns in your training, how your voice can benefit you, how speed makes a huge difference in your leash walking training. When you're considering the location and the time of day, you know, if there's too much, too much, uh, temptation, let's say, you need to change the location. So think about that as you're training your dog. Um, talking about head control, maybe a head collar is the right choice. Maybe it is a flat buckle collar that sits up higher, but you need to have a little bit of head control, especially for those really strong pullers. Mm -hmm. And considering, are you being consistent? We do have um, uh, a package tonight specifically for you guys, 15% off of uh, a leather leash, a flat buckle collar, and a gentle leader. These are all the training things that you're going to need to fix that leash walking, uh, all the tools you're going to need to fix this leash walking problem. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, at the end of tonight's show, you're going to be offered an opportunity to go check out our McCann Dogs music channel. We actually have another YouTube channel and we've worked with digital music creators to make music that's specifically for dogs. Mm -hmm. If you, you know, leave your dog home during the day, you can play music and fill that space. Uh, it's awesome. It, 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 it's so helpful. It's all free play too. In the room. Yeah, absolutely. So check that out. Um, and uh, with that, with all of the teaching, all of the training, all of the things we've talked about tonight, the rest, my friends, well, that is up to you. 